Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the fourth in our um, five-part series, Such a Time as This, Racial Justice in the University. My name is Sawika Colbert. I'm a vice dean in the college and so excited to be joined in this work by our colleagues at Georgetown today. This series emerged in response to the racial violence, specifically anti-Black violence, that unfolded this summer and continues to unfold by drawing attention to our faculty's much longer consideration of racial justice and the university's role in advancing it. We will explore how the work of the university may be mobilized for such a time as this. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator who will then introduce our panelists and begin our conversation. Peter Mara, a leading environment and conservative conservation expert is a professor and director of the Georgetown Environment Initiative, Udadasi Professor of Biology and the Environment. He is also the Emeritus Senior Scientist at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. It is my great pleasure to pass things over to Professor Mara. Thank you very much, Soika. Really appreciate you inviting me here today to uh, moderate this really interesting session. So today, folks, we're gonna talk about this really interesting and I think constantly evolving and challenging intersection between social justice, environmental justice, uh, and science, and, and, and medicine. I think this is a really interesting area. And it turns out we have two remarkable colleagues and scholars here at Georgetown that think a lot about both of these, this, or this, this entire area, really, in um, uh, Sheila Foster and, uh, uh, and um, Lakshmi Krishnan. And so what I'd first like to do is introduce both uh, and describe a little bit about their backgrounds and then we'll get into to, to the discussion. So Sheila Foster holds a, a joint appointment uh, with Georgetown University's Law School and the McCourt School of Public Law and Policy. She also serves as the faculty advisor to the Georgetown Project on State and Local Government Policy and Law and is the lead researcher for the Georgetown Global Initiatives, Global Cities Initiatives, City Diplomacy Project. Prior to coming to Georgetown, Foster was a university professor and the Albert A. Walsh Professor of Real Estate, Land Use, and Property Law at Fordham University. During her tenure at Fordham, she co-directed the Urban Law Center, uh, established the university-wide urban consortium, and served for six years as associate dean for academic affairs and then vice dean at the law school. Prior to joining Fordham, she was a professor at law at Rutgers University in Camden, uh, uh, New Jersey. She received a BA in English with honors from the University of Michigan and then her JD from UC Berkeley. So she's been, she's been around. She's definitely uh, been to some great academic um, areas. One fun fact about Sheila that you probably don't know is that she's been a yogi for 25 years. So her time in Berkeley, uh, really paid dividends in terms of uh, influencing her her uh, meditative state and her, her yoga philosophies. So we can take questions about that uh, a little bit later. Lakshmi Krishnan has a, an MD from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and also a PhD in English literature from the University of Oxford. So quite the interesting mix. She was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford uh, as well. She completed her internal residency, medicine residency at, at Duke University. She's a first generation immigrant born in Bombay, India. Lakshmi then grew up in the United Kingdom before eventually settling in, in the States. Uh, her research focuses on diagnosis and clinical reasoning. And she is writing right now a book on the cultural and intellectual history um, uh, of diagnosis and detective practices. It's called The Doctor and the Detective, A Cultural History of Diagnosis. It's forthcoming from Johns Hopkins University Press. Her specific areas of interest are in health equity and the history of health disparities, intellectual history of medicine, 19th century and early 20th century literature and medicine, and how culture responds to these, these illnesses. A fun fact about Lakshmi is that she used to be heavily involved in theater and she's acted and directed in over a half dozen plays. She's done some improv. So Derek Goldman, if you're watching this, um, you've got a new recruit for, for um, uh, uh, performing arts at Georgetown. So uh, let's, get, let's get right into it. I'm really uh, um, honored to be here with both of you. And uh, folks, if you have questions, please post them in the q and I'll be, I'll be checking the Q&A periodically. 
Um, we hope to turn this into an open discussion eventually. So let's start off with Sheila. And Sheila, would you give us a sort of a broad array of, of uh, your research, tell us about what you're working on right now, but also I wanna know when your aha moment hit, when was it then you realized, were, were you five years old, 15 years old? And what was it that really influenced you to really make you think this is my passion? What lit that fire? And I'm gonna, after, after Sheila's done Lakshmi, I'm gonna ask you the same thing. So thank you and great to be here. It's quite an honor to be on the panel with Lakshmi and to be moderated by you, Pete. Um, so um, I'll start with the latter part of the question. At age seven, I announced to my parents I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I don't think I quite understood why. I mean, I attribute it to maybe watching Perry Mason <laughs> um, on the television, but something sparked my interest. And I also grew up with a mother um, who grew up under Jim Crow in the South. So, and then who kind of made her way to uh, get her PhD while she had four kids and uh, then to be a professor as well as um, a provost, a vice provost. And so, but I was always left with a sense of an unfinished project in America. So when I went to law school, um, I certainly um, wanted to continue the project of perfecting our nation uh, in, in particular civil rights. So I think when I came out, I was interested in what that looked like at that time in our country, having been past a major civil rights movement. Um, and it was really only later after law school that I, um, uh, uh, became interested in what uh, for many years uh, was my focus in my academic career, which is environmental justice. I didn't really know anything about the environment. I mean, I wasn't raised, and I think I speak for at least my generation, a lot of communities of color raised to uh, think about the environment in the ways that I think the mainstream environmental movement um, uh, represented it, mainly as something that's out there that we go to relax and access the, our natural resources, um, and it's a place of leisure. But at the time that I was coming up uh, as an academic, uh, um, there was increasing attention paid to a broader notion of the environment as the places where people live, work, and play, our communities, and that those communities for many populations um, are unhealthy communities. Um, and they're unhealthy because of a complex array of factors. Um, um, including the fact of poor housing and a lot of the things that are connected to the unfinished uh, civil rights project, right? Not a fair distribution of resources, but also a lot of policy and legal decisions that we make and the way that we regulate the environment, not to take into account the synergistic effects of let's say living next to a highway, having a number of polluting facilities placed in your neighborhood um, and having old lead paint in your home and contaminate itself or uh, soil from legacy industries, uh, which are no longer operating, but left in these communities. So I started teaching in Camden. And uh, in Camden, it, uh, one of those communities in particular in South Camden was a classic, what we call environmental justice community, um, a community that really did suffer from a disproportionate burden of all kinds of pollutants and exposures and in ways that our regulators weren't really accounting for and kept putting polluting sources there. Um, and so that's a lot of part of a, a lot of what my uh, research has been about. Since then, I have expanded a little bit more broadly uh, to looking at uh, the role of cities and local governments and policies and law in shaping communities more generally. And I uh, do that through the lens of what's called the commons, which is an environmental um, lens, which is uh, the question of how we take care of shared resources together and how uh, communities can have a strong voice and role in managing and governing and stewarding their resources. So I'll stop there. So I'm working on an MIT Press book on that subject. That's wonderful. I've got so many questions for you, but let's move over to, to Lakshmi. Um, Lakshmi, if you could do the same thing, let us know. Uh, about your research areas, it's fascinating. And then also about sort of when you realized that you wanted to go into medicine or go into English and when you made your decision. Clearly I didn't, I never made a decision, Pete. <laughs> But it's it's such an honor to be here to you know to be on this panel with Professor Foster and and with you and I just want to say thanks again for inviting me to this. Um, so many ways to answer this question, but I guess I'll I'll go back to my origin story as well and just say that 
growing up, you know, grew up a uh, kind of classic immigrant story, born in India, we moved all over the place. My family ended up settling in East Tennessee, so in Appalachia. Um, and so the things that were my anchors in a way were my family, my community, but also these particular um, seemingly contradictory intellectual interests. So I always loved reading and science. I always loved narrative and experiments. And I loved the kind of discursive aspects of figuring out an investigation. So it sort of makes sense that I am now working on a project on investigations. Um, so these cognitive interests were always linked for me, but then I grew up in Bombay, a city with huge health inequities, huge income inequities. And I, I would say, you know, that really fueled um, my commitments to social justice, which followed me on my trajectory um, to the UK and the US. And so all of these things to me felt like they naturally fit together. I've just always been interested in why things work or don't work the way that they do. Um, I'm very bad at calculus, so I didn't become an engineer and instead decided to take words and arguments as kind of my, my toolkit. Um, so in terms of the, my specific work right now and the work on diagnosis, I actually do remember the moment I thought of this project, which I can expand on at any point, but I was sitting in a clinical pathologic conference in residency in North Carolina. And this is a kind of medical guild ritual in which a trainee, usually a resident or a medical student, presents a, a mystery medical case in a very specific format and the whole group solves the puzzle. And I was just struck then by the responses to this ritual and many times since then, how much what is perceived of as a kind of thrill or glamour in medicine um, includes this act of solving a mystery and how decentered the patient is often in that process. Um, and I can't tell you how many doctors I've spoken to over the years who talk about Sherlock Holmes as a kind of gateway drug to entering the, the medical field. So I thought this was absolutely fascinating and I wanted to learn more. And I also started to wonder about what the critique of this approach might be. And you know, as, as I'll get into, there are, there are definitely many. So to answer your question about what I'm broadly interested in, um, it's, it's the cultural and intellectual history of medicine, how the relationship between health practices and the humanities can illuminate how we understand health and illness and healing. Um, why is X thing done in such a way? What are the historical and cultural concepts, uh, contexts of its inception and perpetuation? And then what evidence can we find in the archive, in lived experiences, in oral histories, and the activism of communities? And then what critique does this allow us to generate? Um, and of course, you simply cannot undertake this work looking at health practices without grappling with the profound impact of medical racism historically and, and currently. And so to really deconstruct these practices, one of the things I'm interested in is how do we turn this historical literary humanities kind of work toward health equity, toward a more just form of healthcare delivery. And I firmly believe that reading the history, teaching our students this far upstream, searching out these sources and, you know, kind of recentering these narratives and undoing, particularly for those of us who have clinical medical training, aspects of that training from the grass, grassroots level up. So I will stop there. Yeah, I mean, I'm shivering listening to both of you talk because you're just hitting me at the core with the work that you're doing and how impactful the work that you're doing is. this to sort of move into this, this obvious topic, which is the pandemic and the health disparities around the pandemic. And, you know, how this is disproportionately impacting people of color, people of lower incomes. And I don't think it's just in the US, that's probably true internationally, but I, I don't know for sure. But I'd, I'd love to hear both of you talk a bit more about, about the pandemic and how what you do is really encapsulated with this very big issue that the world is dealing with now. So I don't know if that gives you enough of a prompt, but I'd love to hear maybe Lakshmi, you could go first and then move, we can go to Sheila. Yeah, I would, I would be happy to. And thanks for that question, because it's obviously the kind of elephant in the room. Um, and, you know, as we know, um, 
pandemics reveal they're these great magnifiers, great revealers. They're not great equalizers, as has been as has been touted. Um, they re reveal all of these inequalities and fractures in such profound ways. So, you know, I want I want to acknowledge all of the people who have done incredible health equity work for so long, uh, who have been saying this for so long. And in some ways, you know, I think a, a lot of us have awoken to to some of these realities um but i'll take it it's it's uh perhaps a silver lining of this um you know i don't need to repeat the numbers as we know um mortality rates for black americans for native and indigenous peoples for latinx americans are just i mean and the numbers are just getting worse you know as the as the data started pouring in in the early days of the pandemic uh, it was unfortunately unsurprising and the very dangerous and disturbing trajectory is that now eight months later, we really haven't seen much change in those numbers. So, so we know that, as you said, SES um, is very important as well. Issues um, that have a long historical trajectory, housing segregation, redlining, all of these things that have, that have perpetuated circumstances that make it difficult to do search social distancing in particular communities, particular communities being essential workers, um, being you know, not able to um, do what many of us are able to do, which is the privilege of kind of working from home. So those issues um, in, in my work, I will say in the last six months or so, I am not a historian of epidemics. I've always had a fascination with that work, but I have turned a little bit towards that. So. Um, and without going on too much of a tangent, but part of my book had been an examination of the 1918 influenza pandemic, looking at it through the lens of a mass medical mystery that was a catastrophic failure I mean, for, the, for the kind of scientific establishment um, and is overlooked in a lot of the historiography of that period. Well, when COVID-19 happened, I started asking the question, what do we know about vulnerable communities during that pandemic? And as I went digging, and this was in collaboration with some wonderful health equity colleagues at uh, Johns Hopkins, where I, was still, where I still was at the time, what we found, of course, was that there was lots of underreporting, an absence of data, but that some of these patterns were definitely kind of circumscribed at that time, particularly in the African American community. What we also found was interesting um, and complicated responses, both within the mainstream media within the black media, lots of kind of uh, the you know, sort of black periodicals working against some of these da dangerous ideas of biological immunity, for example, that black people can't get influenza. Um, we, we also looked at how segregation uh, unwittingly might have functioned as a kind of protective quarantine, quite ironically. Um, and then what we also found was that black Americans in this period, though actually they had, as far as we know, a lower morbidity and mortality from the pandemic, which is still a bit of a historical question, like why is that? Um, the case fatality rate, meaning the likelihood of dying once you contracted influenza, if you were black in America in that, in that time was higher. And that points up all of these issues that I'm sure you know Professor Foster is going to get into as well. Um, these really environmental and housing issues and access to healthcare and what hospitals would admit black patients and where they were sent if they actually got admitted. Um, so I could I could obviously talk much longer about that, but that's that's just one angle I think of this question. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for that. It's fascinating, uh, Sheila. Can you yeah. elaborate on this? And, yeah. and one of the things that I'm really wondering about, I mean, the science is clear, right? And so mm -hmm. I'm a scientist and I'm always banging my head against the wall. It's like the science is, I mean, it's truth. I, I think it's, it's the truth. And why can't this get into the policy? Why can't get this, get it into the law? And why can't we be more effective with how we practice this? Why does this, does Flint happen over again? Why does this, why do these things happen over and over and again? And now with the pandemic, it's happening again. So. Yeah. Would you mind going because off? We have structural or systemic inequality in this society, right? So, you know, it's funny. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, it was often said that the virus does not discriminate, and it was an, an equalizer. But, you know, as someone who works in climate and environmental justice, neither do hurricanes or heat waves. But when they land on an unequal landscape, <laughs> then like the professor just said, it exposes the inequalities uh, that we have. And so 
what we saw, so for instance, New York was an epicenter in the spring. Um, and, you know, right away, we began to see that higher um, infection rates and deaths in Black and Latinx um, populations, in particular in the boroughs, um, and also neighborhoods with high poverty rates, um, in part because of a number of factors, for instance. Number one, the affluent had left Manhattan <laughs> to go to their second homes, but you know, it's what um, I believe Congresswoman um, Ocasio-Cortez uh, described as the racial justice paradox, that some of these groups, racial and ethnic groups, or the same groups that have more food, employment, and housing insecurity are also more vulnerable to COVID-19 infection. Why? We now know that it's an indoor spreading uh, virus. So if one in five black workers and one in six Latinx workers um, are not able to, or less than, I'm sorry, one in five and one in six are able to work remotely. These workers were, um, you know, getting on public transit um, and therefore were more exposed. They were in multi-generational households uh, that are more common among immigrant Black and Latinx populations. African um, Americans are overrepresented in jails and prisons and uh, detention centers. But also, and we heard about this, the underlying comorbidities like asthma, obesity, high pressure um, that uh, mark these groups. But what we didn't think about was that those are linked also to other structural inequalities. So a Harvard Public Health um, a study showed very early on that there were, was higher mortalities in counties nationally that high, had higher levels of fine particulate air pollution or PM 2.5. And we know that race and exposure to PM 2.5 is strongly correlated. So the hardest hit communities of color, let's say in New York, uh, in uh, Brooklyn, in the Bronx, suffer from high rates of air pollution, asthma, and other respiratory illnesses. The communities that are food deserts that have high rates of obesity, again, they're more vulnerable. So, you know, so these are not, so these may be neutral phenomena, but when you have such deep structural and systemic inequality, then all the virus does, or a, a heat wave or a hurricane, <laughs> is simply to expose and to magnify that. And so that's the way I think about it. And why can't we get at these? Because the way in which we regulate things in law, whether it's civil rights law or environmental law, for instance, is that we take things um, uh, um, in very categorical, uh, very narrow ways. So, you know, civil rights law asks whether you've intentionally discriminated. Well, so if this stuff is structural, you're not going to find intentional discrimination. Environmental laws um, regulate by pollutant or media, w water or lead or PM 2.5, but they don't consider the synergistic or cumulative effects of a lot of different phenomena. So the short answer is that law does not take into account structural inequality very well. And so that's been my finding across my career and that we really do need other kinds of policies in particular and even non-legal um, interventions that can take that structural, those structural conditions into account. Um, and if we don't, then we'll continue to see what we've seen in COVID. Hmm. Fascinating. Along those lines, I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the processes and I, obviously there's a lot of deep seated and long-term processes that influence what happens in urban centers. And this is, this is for you, Sheila. Um, I'm wondering to what degree does gentrification itself, something that's been happening around a lot of urban areas, changing, you know, the ability for people to live in certain places, the ability to the people, how people move across across uh, urban urbanization gradients, how they get to their jobs, how this perhaps unintentionally has perhaps not has impacted and magnified these impacts that you've just talked about a little bit. Can you talk talk to that? Absolutely. I mean, so it's funny because one of the reasons I moved away from just focusing on environmental justice is what we see today. The very communities that I was working in, Harlem, Camden, et cetera, are now gentrified. You know, the Bronx, uh, South Brooklyn. So these environmental justice communities are now being cleaned up <laughs> and uh, housing and other amenities placed in them and are being gentrified. Where are the people that were there going, right? Um, some 
um, academics have called this the great demographic inversion, right? It used to be there was flight from cities to the suburbs, right? Now those same populations, they could be, you know, the millennials, the creative class, affluent empty nexters are now moving back to cities um, and, um, and making them more expensive, which makes it uh, difficult for um, these legacy residents to stay. So the consequence of that is that because, and also, we also know that know that most economic productivity and, acti and activity is concentrated or agglomerated in cities, and in particular the superstar cities, right? So New York and Chicago and Los Angeles produce more than uh, more gross domestic product than some countries, <laughs> and so people need to agglomerate around cities, but cities are so expensive that then you have the most vulnerable populations living further and further out and they're having to bear the cost of commuting and now the exposure, right? Because they can't work from home. Um, so that's why I look at kind of cities and urban land economics and urban economics and also how we create more just cities um, because you really can't, deal with a lot of these other issues unless we think about the frameworks that we have to create the environments and the communities that people live in. And that has to start from looking at the way our economy works and who's in and who's out and what are the structures that keep people on the uh, periphery of that economy and hence um, uh, vulnerable, uh, not just economically, but in all these other ways. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, Lakshmi, I, I want to um, continue on the COVID front just a little bit, and I want to go back in history a little bit. I want to capitalize on your historical context and, and how important that is. And, and I did dig around in your CV a little bit and saw that you published some papers on some earlier pandemics going back to 1880s and, and the, and the uh, Spanish flu in 1918. And I'm wondering what evidence there is that there were health, that there were actually disparities there too, that certain groups were being disproportionately impacted then. And I'm wondering about how you research that sort of thing. I'm a scientist, so I, I'm curious what your methods were. How do you study that sort of thing? How do you look at that? And were the drivers different or were the drivers the same then? Yeah, thank you, Pete, for a, another very interesting question. Um, this is this is just fascinating because it's it gets at one of the issues I'm really interested in, which is what do humanistic methods add in a way to scientific inquiry, right? What are the things, what are the kinds of experiences and narratives that don't make it into large scale sort of scientific investigation in quite the same way or experimental or verifiable investigation? Um, and, and what we find quite interestingly, so I'll, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, you know, I've worked on, as you said, the 1890s so-called Russian influenza, big heavy caveat there. It was thought to have originated in St. Petersburg. Um, I, it's very interesting how pandemics are named. There's always a kind of xenophobic um, origin, or origin story there. But anyway, um, 1890s Russian influenza in the UK and looking at its kind of resurgent waves and how it was linked to particularly chronic illness and long-term uh, what we call sequelae. So that the kind of after effects of the infection long after the infection has passed. And that's a very interesting parallel to COVID because we are seeing now, as many of you all know, this emerging kind of category of COVID, long COVID or COVID long haulers who are people and the question is, who are those people, right? But uh, who are people who are experiencing weird symptoms, sometimes vague symptoms, sometimes things that are not very quantifiable. And so the, the Russian influenza is an interesting corollary because um, the, the groups that were sort of mostly affected by it, um, but also often um, ignored in medical offices and in interactions with physicians, tended to be the kind of marginalized of that time. So we don't hear much about, we, uh, about immigrants. We don't hear that much about women. We hear a lot of male sufferers uh, and this British male sufferers going in and having their stories sort of related to, and they, they, they get written up as case histories and things like that. But where do we find the stories of the others? And that's in cultural narratives, that's in fiction, that's in song. Uh, 
So that's very interesting. And then when we think about the 1918, 1919 influenza, similarly, um, where do I go to research the, you know, the undertold or the untold stories? Um, you go to like blues songs, like Essie Jenkins' 1919 influenza blues. You go to black church registers. You go to, um, you know, as I, as I referred to earlier, the very robust African-American print media um, you know, that, that was that was in heavy circulation and that was viewed as a kind of undoing of um, the mainstream and predominantly white narratives. So that's, you know, that's one of the places where we go. And I think this is why I, I focus so much on, on cultural narratives or cultural responses, because those are often a repository of the things that don't make it into the, the historical archive in a way. Um, the method for this, um, it's, it's, obviously, it's obviously quite different from, you know, say setting up an experiment or setting up a, a trial, but um, I, you know, I think there are a lot more overlaps than we, than we often realize. We ask a question, we identify where we can go to answer that question. We um, vet it rigorously uh, with peers. We, um, you know, come up with some sort of methodological coherence. Uh, but I, I think the, the jewel of the humanities lies in the fact that we can be so qualitative, we can be so individual and variable. And as I said, when, when for those of us particularly who are trying to broaden the canon and, and you know, expand uh, to, these, to these narratives that are not often told, those are excellent places to go, uh, the kind of non, you know, the more peripheral in a way. Does that answer your question? made the mistake and left the mute on, sorry. No, I think, I think it does. And I'm, I'm just wondering though, I just feel like history repeats itself over and over again. And even though we know we have to go back in history and, and learn from history, some things just keep getting repeated. And I'm not sure that we're, we're you know, taking it to heart. We're not making the changes. We're not, and in a lot of cases, we're not listening to the science. And that's sort of, that's sort of a theme that I keep coming back to in a lot of things is that, you know, we haven't elevated science to the level, or, or, you know, that it needs to be elevated. This information, this, and, and the practices that we use to sort of make sure we're, we're getting accurate data and accurate science so we can move on. And I'm, you know, both of you, if you could sort of talk about that a little bit, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we use science as a better equalizer, perhaps, to try to, you know, right the injustices. I'll, I'll save something very brief and then I, I would love to hear what Professor Foster thinks about this. But one, one thing, and this is, this is one of my big things, which is that the humanities and the social sciences should not be anti-science, right? Like this is, as you said, we've, we're seeing the kind of dangers of di really disinformation um, circulating. At the same time, I do think that, um, you know, ignoring how science is so socially and culturally constructed is very, very dangerous as well, um, you know, in that it, it can be very internally focused. And so uh, there needs to be a sort of bu bridge building between these disciplines um, to kind of elevate each other in a way. Um, but I think it's, it's incredibly important not to draw sort of a false dichotomy between narrative competence and humanistic competence and the sort of tools of science. Because I actually think they're much more aligned uh, than we realize. Um, and I can, I'll say more later. So yeah, I mean, I have a couple of uh, thoughts. Um, one is that, you know, so I grew up in a family of doctors. I was the first lawyer, so, so, so even when black folks were having a hard time becoming doctors, I had a lot in my family, but yet and still, there's a deep distrust in the African-American community about science, right? Uh, about doctors. Um, and you would think that would have waned and it has some, but I'm struck by the number of peers I have that will not go to the doctor, right? Um, and, you know, I think the current political environment hasn't helped this. Uh, so if we need, uh, a diverse uh, pool of folks to volunteer for vaccines. What happens when, you know, some um, populations opt out of that, right, of those trials? Um, how do we make science matter for everyone? So I think that's the first thing. 
that I want to uh, problematize. And I don't know what to do about that, but that's out there. Um, the second thing, and it goes back to environmental justice. I mean, one of the things I was struck at, uh, by is that we have institutions like the Environmental Protection Agency or even climate scientists set up to tell us kind of what the fact is, right? What's gonna happen, what the dangers are, but what happens when those constructs, so, so take pollution for instance. One of the things that the environmental justice community argued um, about with the scientists at the EPA is that the way we set, let's say water quality standards did not take into account subsistence fishers who consume more fish or the way we set pesticide exposure does not take into account um, immigrant farm workers in the Central Valley in California and others that they're often in that they use white bodies and white male bodies, right, um, to set standards that are applicable to all of us, right. In the same, I sit on the New York City Mayor's Panel on Climate Change, which for many um, iterations was dominated by client scientists and only recently have brought on social scientists to kind of map social vulnerability. Because if you just listen to the climate science, which is obviously very important, and there's you know, a consensus on some things that's important, but again, it doesn't tell us what the social cost of climate change is going to be um, spread among different communities. And it can only tell us, like environmental laws do, the aggregate picture. But if you only look at the aggregate picture, you miss a lot of the distributional consequences, right? So even if we could say we've got the cleanest air and water we've ever had <laughs> because our environmental laws have done the job, at the same time, we can say, but the people paying the cost of that are these uh, poor black and brown communities. Why? Because even though we all produce waste, we put the facilities in their neighborhood, right? <laughs> They're actually, so, so science, so our science, our hard science, so to speak, um, has got to be open to both um, acknowledging the reality, I think, on the ground and in our social lives um, and the inequalities without diluting, I think, uh, the standards that, you know, science plays by. And I think that we see that across fields. And when that happens, I think the trust part on the part of African American and other communities, you may see that, you know, rise. I have to ask, is, is that a quantitative thing? I mean, does somebody quantify that distrust? Is that a well-known fact? I've never, I've not heard that. Or is that- your... Absolutely. 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 Well-known, well-known fact. I, I, sorry, I'm just interjecting. I'm just like- oh, No, no, no you probably know better than anyone. <laughs> no, it's, and I can just say, I mean, anecdotally, I can say that I, pra you know, I trained in Baltimore. I then practiced in Baltimore. Um, in an, in, at an institution that has a very complicated relationship to the community in which it is based. And I, you know, I cannot tell you, again, take my anecdotes for what it's worth, for what they're worth, but cannot tell you how many of my African American patients have said to me, um, I don't know if I would take a COVID vaccine because you know, the, you know, doc, like, you know, the history of this mm -hmm. institution and black people in Baltimore. And this is, you know, again, this is where kind of excavating that history and applying these, this sort of meta critique to how we do science and how we do research essentially is so important because people just wanna know that we are aware of that and are trying to do something different. And there are so many well-being scientists who, who, who are, and there is an information and a kind of communication gap that I think we, we need to bridge. Well, that's, that's an excellent point. I'm wondering, you know, how do we, do we need to teach science differently and law and and do something differently with respect to education to try to stop these historic patterns? We At some point, we need to address these historic disparities, these gaps, and implement this, this fix if that's truly the problem. And how do we do that better? What are we not doing? Probably lots. Yeah, I mean, so I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, so in law schools, you know, we're, we've increasingly um, you know, um, started to incorporate quantitative analysis more into law and uh, judges have too. Unfortunately, it's law and economics. It's not really science as such. But, you know, this rush to want to quantify is a good thing because I think it does, it theoretically can increase our trust in facts and data. But on the other hand, um, if you treat it as if that's the answer and those are the only, um, data points that matter, 
um, they tend to miss so much and exactly what we're talking about. Um, and so I think that it's really, yeah, so I do think we should do a better job, um, including lawyers, right, um, of kind of uh, quantifying less kind of normative, you know, ideological debates. Um, you know, is there a set of facts that we can agree on? Is there a set of data that we can agree on? But the problem always is that trust factor because, well, who's doing it and what's the methodology and who does it leave out, right? And until you get to those, and those aren't fundamentally scientific questions. I think they're normative choices, actually. And that's what is hard for scientists and, and economists to tussle with, right? Because if you start to believe so deeply in your methodological framework and nothing else will fit into it. So let's take economics. If efficiency is your only value, then by definition, you're speaking past me, right? You're not speaking to me, right? Um, efficiency has a role, but if yeah. it doesn't account for, you know, inequality, distributional inequalities that aren't quote unquote inefficient, then I think um, you shortcut the value and the power of that methodological framework. And I mean, I can't say what that corollary is in science, but I'm sure there is one. Yeah, it's fascinating. Just to if I can, remind, may I jump yeah. in, Pete, just, just yeah. like a short, yeah. um, just sure. because I, I think there is, I'm about to make a very optimistic statement. I hope I don't regret this in a few years, but I, I do think there is a sea change, at least coming in medical education. Um, and this is, you know, this goes back to my silver lining comment earlier, um, if there's any, any positive that comes out of this. Um, I trained not that long ago, but we were taught in medical school that uh, basically race is biological. I mean, really. And that's shocking, right? Um, because it, it really wasn't that long ago. And now we are seeing this kind of very grassroots driven, it's often very student driven, change in terms of trying to actually dismantle the medical curriculum and rebuild it. Um, it's a very compressed curriculum, as you can imagine, there's, there's, you got to learn anatomy and biochemistry and all of these things. And there has been this, I think, a kind of false view that softer areas like racial justice, humanities, health disparities, and you know, all of these things, where do we fit them into the medical curriculum? But I, I do think they are going to start to be actually kind of baked in, in, in different ways. I mean, speaking for, for Georgetown, the medical students in, in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd wrote uh, basically a, an open letter um, saying, you know, look, we need to, we need to work on reforming the curriculum and there are efforts underway. You know, as, as Professor Foster said, it's a mixed bag, who does it? who gets represented on these task forces and committees and, and you know, how do we do this in a really kind of thoughtful way. But um, we, are, we are realizing that lots of the things that we have used as scientific metrics in medicine, lung function testing, kidney filtration rates, like these all had adjustments for race and, they, and, and in a lot of medical systems still do. Um, and you know, again, reifying this idea of race as biological, and so undoing those things, kind of one at a time, is one way. But you know, as an educator, and this goes back to the larger theme of this this panel and this series, this is where I do think the university has a role in uh, trying to undo this. I mean, we should be undoing this with undergraduates who want to go into healthcare, who want to go into environmental justice and studies. Like this is, this is where we can, I think, make a real impact. And the students are already there. Um, so. Yeah, I, I um, just want to mention that we have about 15 minutes left. So if people have questions, please post them in the Q&A and I'll, I'll keep my eyes peeled for that. I want to change it around just a little bit. And I want to get a little personal with both of you, if you don't mind just because you know, all of our experiences are so important for future generations, the next generations coming up. And I'm, and I'm wondering if either of you encountered obstacles coming up in your careers that could have easily you know, shut you down, that could have easily put you in a different direction. And I'm wondering you know, what those obstacles were, how you got around them, how you would tell people out there that, you know, you know, this is what you got to do thinking about this, if, if you if you encounter this sort of thing uh, in, in the future. So um, Lakshmi, you want to take that one first? Sure, I'd be I'd be happy to. Um, well, so I, I've definitely been told no a lot. 
um, and, or that's not possible, or you, you can't do all of those things. Uh, as you know, my interests are, are kind of are wide ranging. Um, and I, as I said at the beginning, I haven't, I never really picked. <laughs> and, and that has been a, that's been a cause of some, you know, tension at different points in my, in my career trajectory, which I'm still early in my career trajectory. Um, I've had, I've had professors in graduate school tell me you're never going to finish your degree. Um, you know, Racism and sexism are pervasive issues. I don't need to belabor that point for this audience. For me, uh, very powerful moments of realizing what it is to be a brown woman in the academy really was um, when I was in the UK for graduate school. So even though I'd grown up there when I was younger, I was in a kind of insulated bubble of my sort of family unit. Um, but I experienced really you know, far more powerful discrimination in that context than I ever had in America. And I do remember that, I mean, it's, it's sad that you need those kinds of experiences in a way to awaken you, but remember that as being a moment where I realized a little bit, a small measure of what my black and Latinx friends and colleagues might go through in the States. So that was another, um, you know, that was another kind of moment for me. Uh, but I also think part of my growth, and hopefully I'm still growing uh, in this area, is understanding when these kind of energies are operative, recognizing when the fight is worthwhile and when it's time to just redirect my, my energies. Um, and then in terms of doing interdisciplinary work, one of the challenges has been explaining the methods and value to the separate disciplines that one inhabits. You can imagine the words that I use when I'm talking to an audience of clinical physicians um, are quite different from you know, when I'm speaking with, for example, my literature or history colleagues. But I do think that's getting better, more and more people kind of getting it and who are already in this sort of inter and transdisciplinary space. So that's, that's nice. Um, I don't know that I've, yeah, I don't know that I've really kind of overcome obstacles of sort of found ways around them or just gone in a different direction. Um, I have had extraordinary mentorship and support from my family, my social community networks. Um, and there's a core group of my close friends, all of us who went through graduate school. It's really graduate school, I think, that brought us together um, around the same time. And it's a far flung network, which has been tough during COVID, but um, they're really a, a source of strength and kind of hard truths, so. Thank you, thank you for that. Sheila? Yeah, I mean, way too many microaggressions to go into, so I'm just going to skip over those <laughs> and uh, try to take kind of the 360 degree view. I mean, I, I have to say that one of the main obstacles is being told what you can't do or that what you're doing, people aren't getting, right? Um, and so, you know, when I started writing about environmental justice, there was hardly anything in the legal literature about it. And some of my colleagues, even as I was coming up for tenure, was just like, I just don't get it, right? Why are you talking to communities, trying to do these qualitative you know, case studies? It's not law. Um, and, you know, and the same with the, uh, some of the work I'm doing now. And, and, and so, you know, part of that is, um, one of the ways I've overcome that is just to remember why I went to law school, right? Remember why I became an academic, connect to that original purpose and keep doing it. Um, and also to think about the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, I don't get tenure, maybe this is not my path, right? I'll find something else. Um, because I do think that um, academia in particular is a path dependent um, environment. And so people like to see themselves replicated and you, you have to do things a certain way. And of course you have to play by those rules. I mean, I'm not suggesting you don't. And I did, I mean, I had basically, you know, two bodies of scholarship, one very, traditional and the other, what I wanted to do. Um, and so, um, and, and so, and part of that, I think is uh, being young black woman, you know, I want to talk about again, the teaching evaluations and all the ways that people are constantly saying that, you know, you're to this or to that, or you're not enough this or not enough that when other colleagues who look differently or are of a different gender aren't getting that. Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of, we deal with that. We have to deal with that. But I think the meta stuff, I think just kind of, I came in this with a passion. Often we do, people of color, because we know there's an unfinished project, right? Um, I grew up again with a mother who was traumatized by Jim Crow <laughs> and not, notwithstanding her uh, success ultimately in life. And so, if, and so that's my driver, right? And so staying focused on that and staying connected to purpose I think is the way that I overcome, and meditation, of course, <laughs> yoga and meditation, back to. 
You know, your history with um, Jesuit institutions is interesting. And I'm, I'm wondering to what degree has that sort of influenced your thinking, um, being at obviously Georgetown's a Jesuit institution. So just wonder if you can talk about that a little bit and then I'll, I'll finish up with both of you asking if you have any final insights into, into our discussion today. Yeah, so I've taught at two Jesuit institutions, Fordham for 20 years and then now Georgetown. I mean, I have to say, coming into Fordham, I had mixed feelings. I was not trying to teach at a Jesuit institution. I mean, I, I've come to appreciate, I'll say this, I'll come to, and at Fordham, our president was a priest, um, a Jesuit priest. Uh, and so um, I've come to appreciate that Jesuit institutions and the Jesuits and the history of the Jesuits um, embrace things that definitely connect with who I am and my purpose. One is a critical, um, and, I, and it's how they distinguish themselves, um, a critical analytical approach to education and to knowledge. <clears throat> I mean, I think that's part of the Jesuit history, always questioning the curia uh, personalis, right? The kind of care of the whole person. Uh, but at least at Jesuit law schools, both of the law schools I've taught at have a justice is the end, law is the means, right? Um, which is to say that it's a full embrace of I think the Jesuit tradition that we're here to achieve justice. Now, our views of justice may be pluralistic, but nevertheless, in a lot of law schools, I don't think you find that there's such a guiding principle that is so strong. And so I like that, very much love that about uh, both institutions is leading with justice. Um, and it shapes the program, it shapes our curriculum, and frankly, it shapes the kind of students that attend these schools. That's, that's wonderful. Um, if both of you have any sort of, you know, final thoughts or insights that will help our students, and, you know, they're facing disparities, many are facing disparities in their daily lives. So anything that, um, any other ideas or last thoughts would be great. And Lakshmi, if you want to talk about the Jesuit tradition too, that'd be wonderful. Lakshmi, why don't you? Yeah, I'll, 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 um, I'll weigh in a little bit on the, on the Jesuit tradition, and then I'll try to think of some, <laughs> you know, valedictory remarks. But, you know, as you know, I'm new to Georgetown, um, but I am from India where the Jesuit tradition has had a uh, potent post-colonial life. So my dad went to Jesuit school and he still talks about it. Uh, my mom went to convent school. Um, and this was very, you know, it's just very kind of resonant part of my childhood. And they, you know, I think my parents really infused some of my childhood and young adulthood with these principles. And what's so interesting about the Jesuit tradition in India is it gets married to the pluralistic faith traditions of India. So for us, it was part of a kind of, we're very much cultural Hindus. So there was this idea of how do some of those Hindu ideas of Dharma, right? Service essentially, and, and kind of the good works in a way, um, that intellectual rigor doesn't exist without turning it toward the service of others. And I, I think that's in some ways a common language that we all share, whatever our faith or non-faith. Um, and, and I think I've, I've always viewed my work in that way without situating it in a particular tradition. Is this furthering a greater cause? Is this serving others in some way? Um, and like Professor Foster, I, I find the notion of Kura personalis to be very resonant um, and something that we're adopting into the work of medical humanities, Georgetown. How do we care for the whole person? But that also means the practitioner and the person you know, that they are ministering to, like both people coming together into this healing encounter with their own backgrounds, um, mind, spirit, body, all of that. So that's how I'm interpreting you know, the Jesuit tradition now. And in terms of final remarks, especially for students, uh, one thing I would say is, you know, I was thinking about how we'll know when the work is really afoot or when it's really taking off. And one way I was thinking about it is that I think we go through almost two phases where first it becomes more visible and again, I want to say this acknowledging the decades of work of people like Professor Foster and others who've been you know, at this for a long time. But first, it becomes more visible and we hear about it much more. And that's wonderful. And then I hope that we get to the point where it just becomes more invisible. Right. It's just part of the new paradigm. Um, and and I don't know, that's just a framing that I've been thinking about. That's great. 
Sheila, you want to, uh, Professor Foster? I, I'm still, uh, you know, no. Oh, no, no, first name's fine. Um, <laughs> you know, I think we're living through a hard but extraordinary moment, right? Um, something felt different about the protests this summer. I think we all know that, right? There is a coming together of people who normally wouldn't join <laughs> and didn't join the protests after Ferguson and, you know, Baltimore. Um, and people see that there's something wrong and that it's structural, right? And so what an amazing time to be a student right now, right? Uh, so I think about my students at the law school and at the McCourt School of Policy, um, and they're very focused on this moment on how do I understand the structure, whether it's my state and local government class at the law school, what are the roles of states, what can local governments do, or it's my urban law and policy at the, uh, at the McCourt School, which is, you know, um, how do we, if I go to work for a city, what can they do? How can we start to change this zoning? Let's look at housing. Let's look at all these policies that we have. And let's start to like be really critical and figure out what we need to do. And then let's look at the legacy, like that these policies don't come out of nowhere. And they're frankly not neutral because if we have zoning, because why the kind of zone we have, because the Supreme Court ruled racial zoning illegal in 1923 and local governments went to this other kind of zoning, which separated uh, single family homes from other kind. And then we excluded black folks and others from single family home areas and suburbs. So what a time to be here, right? And to be at Georgetown, a place like Georgetown, what a time to have faculty like Professor Krishnan, I mean, to study with, I mean, I look around the university and I think the resources right now in Georgetown's commitment, I think, to racial justice, as in including not just the slavery project, but also the racial justice initiative, uh, which is nascent. Um, and I and so I would say instead, it's really hard to be depressed right now. <laughs> and, and we are on some low level, right? I mean, it's hard not to be, but it's also there are all these tremendous opportunities um, that I think um, that this generation um, that is coming out, including you know my teenage son, uh, they're very plugged in. They're very aware. They're woke, as we say. Um, and so, what do you do with that, right? What do you do with that? What are what's in our toolbox? So, I would say my last word is, and I'm always telling uh, students this or asked, like, what's in our toolbox, right? What's in our legal toolbox? What's in our poly, uh, 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 policy toolbox? How can we empower? folks to build a toolbox to go out and make the change they want to see in the world. Um, and that's what you're here for. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I uh, this was fascinating. This is just, I, I learned so much from both of you and it's an honor to be at Georgetown University with both of you. Um, I look forward to when we can actually get lunch in person. We get lunch yes, in person sometime. That'll, that would be really fun. Um, that would be so fun. This conversation and figure out really interesting ways for all of our work to sort of intersect. Uh, you know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But it is quite a time. And so this, this, this colloquium is aptly named. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We need to end and we need to go back to our regular, regular work. And thanks everyone for joining us and everyone take care of themselves. Thanks very much. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Such a pleasure. Bye-bye.